afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today as we present the impact of intergeneral rela intergenerational relationships. So with us, we have Dr. Kristen Rapp. She is joining us from Roanoke College and has been there since 2017. Her research takes an intersectional approach to exploring the social determinants of health inequalities in the United States. In particular, her current research examines the roles of state-level state socioeconomic and political contexts in perp perpetuating healthcare inequalities by gender, race, and ethnicity. Dr. Rapp teaches both introductory and upper-level sociology courses and has a particular interest in social social inequality, quantitative research methods, and social determinants of health. Chaplain Chris Bowen has been with Roanoke College for nine years, and prior to coming to Roanoke College, he was pastor at St. Michael's Lutheran Church of Virginia Beach and pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church and has a master's in divinity with honors from Lutheran Theological Southern Seminary and bachelor's of science from L Lenore Ryan College. And I am Teresa Walco, arts and education manager, I have received my bachelor's of science from Radford College with a degree in recreation, parks, and tourism, a concentration in therapeutic recreation, and a minor in psychology. I have extensive experience working with children with special needs and autism and have been part of Brandon Oaks for two years. So Dr. Rapp and Chaplain Bowen, thank you so much for coming out today. So at this point, I will turn it over to Dr. Rapp and she will talk to us about what is intergeneral relationships. Okay, thank you, Teresa, for that introduction. And I'll take the mask off so y'all can hear me. Um, hi, everybody, you can call me Kristen. Um, so I am, uh, I appreciate the introduction of my current research interest. I'm gonna talk about something completely different and that's actually a part of my earlier research as a, as a grad student. I was doing a lot on social relationships, social support, and, and physical health. Um, so I'm going to start there, talking more generally about social relationships and health, and then delve more specifically into the intergenerational side, right? What is the benefit specifically of intergenerational relationships? Um, so uh, as Teresa introduced, I am a social scientist by training, and so as a grad student, I was looking at social connectedness and support and how these factors are associated with better physical and mental health regardless of age. Um, we know that there is a relationship between being and feeling connected with uh, this connected to an array of positive health outcomes, better cardiovascular health, lower blood pressure, better immune function, faster recovery from certain types of cancers or a host of other positive health outcomes that uh, are related to social connectedness and support. Um, the reasons for this continue to be studied. So there is some evidence of a physiological basis for this. So in other words, social connectedness may act on certain hormones, inflammatory markers, to in turn uh, promote better health, improve health outcomes. Uh, specific to older adults, there's a lot of research looking at social connectedness and health. Um, social connectedness reduces risk of chronic disease, uh, improves cognitive resilience, promotes a sense of purpose, joy, identity, if we're looking at the mental health and well-being side. Um, older adults with more social connections and supportive social relationships have um, lower rates of a range of, of chronic health conditions, so heart disease, diabetes, uh, dementia, depression, to name a few. Um, and on the flip side, we can think about more positive outcomes, as I had mentioned, well-being, joy, purpose. So that's a very brief background on a lot of research that exists out there, and I'm happy to talk more on that during the Q&A and more discussion after. Um, all of this is not to scare anybody into becoming a social butterfly. Instead, um, this is just to provide some evidence. Uh, our social relationships matter. That's intuitive. We know our social relationships matter, but there is some science to support this. Um, they give us meaning and support. Um, they appear to benefit our physical health as well. Um, so we're here to talk specifically about intergenerational relationships. So I'm gonna spend the rest of my time on that. Uh, when I think about intergener intergenerational, that's a hard word. <laughs> when I think about intergenerational relationships, the first thing that comes to mind for me is family, right? 
Um, from a young age, our most important relationships are intergenerational. Um, I mean, from the time at, at a young age, we are supported and raised by our parents, grandparents, perhaps aunts and uncles. Um, so it's, it's important <laughs> right off the bat. And then as we age, these relationships often become more bi-directional, right? We see parents and other family continuing to support those younger family members. Uh, and then younger family, family members in turn beginning to provide that support for parents and grandparents and other family members. Um, so these intergenerational relationships within the family are so important to meet everyone's needs. They provide us with opportunities to learn from one another, uh, to better understand different perspectives, to feel mutually supported. Okay, so that's within the family. We can also consider benefits of intergener intergenerational uh, relationships outside of family ties, and that's more what we're talking about here. Um, these connections can be mutually beneficial across generations. So if we look to first youth and young adults, what would uh, young adults get from this? Because we're talking about college students, right? Uh, and high school students as well. Uh, so young adults and youth benefit from receiving mentorship, support, uh, having that adult rooting for them, right? Especially if they don't have that support at home. Uh, they are able to learn from the experiences of older generations. And that is so important. And becoming increasingly rare, as I think Chaplain Chris is gonna talk a bit about. Um, what are the benefits for older adults? Well, intergenerational relationships foster connection. So think back to what I had said a few minutes ago about those general you know, health benefits from social relationships, connections. Um, in addition, serving as a mentor Right, provides that meaning and purpose. Uh, I know that uh, you've spoken previously about the, the seven domains of well-being uh, or wellness. We can connect just about all of those domains to intergenerational relationships in some way. Um, I've already mentioned connectedness and meaning. That's a couple of them. We can also consider identity. Right? Uh, being able to share strengths and personal insights with another person uh, who could really benefit from those insights. That's, uh, to me, pretty identity affirming. Right? Uh, in addition, uh, another domain is growth. So growth and learning across generations. Um, and finally, and I know I could go through all of them, but the other one that comes to mind for me is really just that joy of having a bond, having a relationship, a connection. Um, now, despite all of these benefits that you know, I've started to list out here, um, we have, or we live in an increasingly age-segregated society. And I know, again, Chaplain Chris is gonna talk more about that. Um, and that means we're really collectively missing out on a great opportunity to build a stronger and a healthier community. Um, so I'll leave it at that for the intergenerational piece. I also wanted to speak briefly about the Roanoke College student body, right? Uh, as a college, we pride ourselves in engagement or pride ourselves on engagement with the community. And our students really do crave that engagement, that experience. Uh, we have students with diverse interests and backgrounds who could benefit immensely from mentoring relationships. Yes, they get that on campus from their professors, from counselors, advisors, but having those connections outside of the college would be a really, really wonderful thing, a wonderful experience for our students. Um, I will also say that this cohort is unique in a lot of ways. They're in a lot of ways. They're unique in their experience through the pandemic. Um, most of them did not have that normal high school experience or early college experience. And so they've really experienced unprecedented levels of social isolation. And I know that we can all understand and share in that to some extent. Um, and it, this is isolation from peers, from family, especially extended family across generations, um, from teachers, other mentors, and from the community as a whole. So opportunities like, like the one we're talking about, these weren't available for, for several years for our students. Um, so we're trying to get back in, and we're trying to re-engage with the community in all the ways that we can. 
Uh, I think this is a wonderful opportunity that we're talking about here today, and uh, I look forward to talking some more. So with that, I will hand it over to Chaplain Chris. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, so I want you to stop and think for a second of a person, a trusted adult, you had in your life growing up who was not related to you, okay? Can you think of one? A trusted adult who noticed you, who knew your name, knew something about you, and would ask after you at least once a month. Currently in our country, based on our national survey done in 2020, one in three 13 to 25 year olds in this country have zero trusted adults in their life. Someone who notices them, someone who knows their name, knows their story, and asks after them at least once a month. One in three, 13 to 25 year olds. It's the growing national pandemic underneath the pandemic, right? I mean, think about a trusted adult, right? Someone who sees you, knows your name, and knows your story and asks after you. We know that if a student on our campus has one trusted adult, they're probably still going to be suffering a sense of a lack of belonging, which affects their mental and physical well-being and their ability to perform in the classroom. Once they get to three, which means that's impossible if it's both parents, there's still room for at least one more, right? They begin to see benefits for their physical, mental well-being. Once they get to five, they begin to flourish, right? So if they're on campus, and they have two great parents and a great advisor, they're at the minimum threshold for well-being. There's still room for at least two or more trusted adults in their lives. And so, really, we are coming here to Brandon Oaks um, because there is a need in our community, right? We've, we have almost 2,018 to 23-year-olds on our campus, <laughs> right? We have a faculty and staff of under 500. The odds are not in our favor. We need y'all as well. So when you think about that, on top of the fact that both Brandon Oaks and Roanoke College share an amazing heritage, the legacy of what Lutherans understood about human beings, right? is that we do need education so we can discover our sense of vocation or, or purpose in the world, but it's not just for ourselves. It's education for a vocation for the sake of the common good. Right? Think about that. Education for vocation, a sense of calling for the sake of the common good. To develop that, to cultivate that, takes a community, right? A people who see you, who know your name, and what? Know your story and will ask after you, right? It takes accompaniment. And so we have some wonderful opportunities to celebrate the long-held partnership that we have as partners of the Virginia Center to the ELCA here. Um, and so we come to you today with this reality um, but this reality is not just a problem, it's an opportunity. Um, and um, so we are reaching out to you all um, for the amazing gifts and talents and people that you are and saying, help us think about what could we do that we haven't yet done, but we could do together. And so um, I'm super excited about that. Um, I go way back with your chaplain um, so there's lots of good connection there, um, but we've got some wonderful opportunities to explore these things together, and um, let's see what we can do. Thank you. Thank you. So as Kristen and Chaplain Bowen talked about the health benef benefits and the spiritual benefits, I'm going to talk about why. 
Why intergeneral relationships? Why partner with Roanoke College, William Byrd Navy National Defense Corps cadets, and Chris's coffee and custard? So I chose intergenerational relationships because there's so many amazing benefits for our residents as well as the children and young adults that will be part of this relationship. The other piece is connecting more with our community. We do such a great job of ensuring that all your needs are being met on campus. I think it's easy to find the disconnect from the outside world. Bringing different groups onto campus allows us to connect with different age demographics as well as providing us with the opportunity for them to teach us a thing or two. Brandon Oaks is composed of so many extraordinary residents that have amazing skills, boundless knowledge, and phenomenal life experiences. Our campus is composed of doctors, lawyers, authors, government officials, teachers, and so many other wonderful professions. Every single resident has been highly successful, and these experiences and knowledge deserve to be shared with the younger generation. Working with Roanoke College, we have created the Brandon Oaks Maroon Mentor Program. This partnership will pair a student with a resident, ideally in their expertise, and they will spend time together connecting and learning from their mentor. At this time, I have five residents who have volunteered to participate, and I would love to see at least five more. By becoming a Brandon Oaks Maroon Mentor and sharing your stories and experience, you can improve a child or young adult's academic performance, health, and promote social connections. You'll be able to pass on your skills and knowledge to help kickstart the future of our younger generation and help shape the future leaders of tomorrow. Your life may feel ordinary to you, but it might seem extraordinary to someone else, and that deserves to be shared. So in addition to mentoring with Roanoke College students, we'll be joining forces with William Byrd Navy National Defense Corps. This program is new to William Byrd High School and has been recently established by Senior Chief David Perrin. His hopes for the program are to establish a sense of community and teach students to become engaging citizens, successful future leaders, and be successful students. I believe that we are the perfect candidates to help him obtain these goals. We currently have 50 residents who have served in various branches and terms in the military. Connecting our veterans and cadets will allow the students to experience history in a new way that goes beyond the traditional forms of teaching through books and essays. These intergeneral relationships help make history real and personal for the students, give them context for historical events, and help them to develop the skills to connect from people from many different backgrounds. Chris's Coffee and Custard is a custard and coffee shop that provides employment for adults with special abilities. I hope to partner with them to host Monday night game night of charades and bingo. Building relationships with individuals with special abilities will teach you many important aspects about life in general, as well as help promote social inclusion, community membership, and friendship. So in conclusion, there are a number of opportunities that will impact relationships with Roanoke College the Navy National Defense Corps, and employees of Chris's Coffee and Custard throughout the year. My hope is that each of you will consider giving the gift of time to participate in these various events and support our local community partners. So thank you for your time today. And at this point, we will open the floor for any questions that you may have. Nancy? I, I'm, I'm just thinking the whole time you're talking, what are you talking about when you mentor? What does it mean with us and students at Roanoke College? Like, would we be a grandmother or grandfather? Would we uh, tell them to bring their laundry over here and they can... <laughs> That's the kind of thing I wanted when I was at Roanoke College. And, and the students that I knew there, I was a day student first, and then I lived in the dorm for a while. And what we all wanted was find somebody who would do our laundry for us. <laughs> and you'd get to know the person like that, or even take them to church. So do these things, I mean, and how physically able we are to do 
certain things for them also certainly comes into play when you're talking about how do we decide if we want to mentor because I love knowing other children and children and they are children if they're at Roanoke College you know I mean because my children are even older than Roanoke College are we too old to be a mentor for Roanoke College kids what what do they want what what is expected of us as a mentor so age should never define your ability for sure and so the mentoring to me means again giving that gift of time you know if you have experience as a teacher ideally we would pair you with a student that is going into teaching you can talk about your experiences tips and tricks that you found were successful in that environment um, just leading through example. I think washing your laundry is getting a little close and personal, but we would love for that relationship to be on that comfort level. Kristen? Yeah. Um, I, I would reiterate that I, I, it's my understanding there is zero expectation for anyone to do anyone's laundry or um, provide that kind of instrumental support. Instead, this is more about having that open line of communication, right, and providing mentorship um, it could be academically, career-wise. It sounds like that's the way that the pairing is going to work, so I think that'll probably be the, the first step. And then beyond that, I mean, being there as a trusted resource of knowledge, not of can you do this for me and that for me, and um, that's, again, a completely different level of support that that's beyond what we're talking about. But I appreciate you asking for clarity because we've just been throwing the word mentorship around, and, yeah, we can certainly define that more. not in any hurry. What kind of a time involvement are you talking about? I know that can vary with people, mm -hmm. but are these students expected to spend X amount of time? Are we committing to three hours a, one, a month or, or what? what? What's the time commitment? I don't think that has been defined yet. Um, there's flexibility. If you're willing to give three hours a week, that's great. If you need to start at a couple times a month just to get to know your mentee and then build from there, that's great as well. I think no matter what time you're giving, if, they're, if you're building that relationship where they can count you as that trusted individual, that speaks volumes. So again, like I said, I mean, is to increase their sense of belonging in the world, like I actually belong in the world, I mean, it really, I mean, one check in a month is bare minimum, believe it or not, and that does have an impact. But, you know, we haven't really set a, a time constraint on that, but our students are on campus for 14 weeks each semester, right? So that's, that would be the, I mean, then we have summer break or, or winter break, right? So, um, you, you're probably talking, meeting every second to third week, maybe. Sometimes on campus, if you're able, they can come this way too, um, you know, sort of thing. It could be a phone conversation at times. It could be just a note in the mailbox. Trust me, they still go looking for mail. Um, uh, just a note, right? A, another human being sent me a note. It's huge, this is very rare right. that our students get what they call snail mail, right? That it comes from the post service they call it snail mail right so yes has this idea been presented to the students or how how has it been presented and how what was the feedback you got from the students we've got some friends in the audience you might be able mm -hmm. to speak to that side of the equation All right, I'll start again. I'm Shannon Anderson. I'm a faculty member at the college, and the students have not really been made aware of this, except for a few that have worked closely with us. We really, we had this amazing conversation with Teresa late in the fall, and Kristen and I got really excited and, and were all in and wanted to get this launched. We do have one student with us, um, Andy Chitwood, who is a public health student, so I get to see Andy quite a lot. I'm his advisor as well. I won't make him answer for all students. Um, but students are looking for these kinds of connections. And my guess is it could begin with 
asking some questions about career, having coffee, to going to church or going to dinner, um, coming over to campus and joining your, your mentee for lunch in the commons. There are all kinds of possibilities. And I think all of us can think back to these same trusted people that you were talking about earlier, and the relationships are really different from each other. Sometimes a phone call can mean the world if it comes in a day that was just a rough day, right? So it doesn't have to be grand gestures. It doesn't have to be huge. I do think contact at least once a month, some kind of contact. Otherwise, they lose that sense that you're asking about them, that you're thinking about them when they're not present. So there does have to be some constancy to the relationship, but it is not gonna be people expecting you to do anything one of the things we talked about was maybe bringing those of you who are interested in, an event, in, a, in a program like this over to campus together, um, do a campus tour, have lunch together, have all the students and their mentors, and it would just be fun. I just think it would be wonderful. And a lot of our students are far from home, and so a little bit of surrogate family actually goes a long way. You don't need to be their grandparent, but it can feel really nice to have these kinds of connections. Is that helpful? So, I, t first of all, Teresa and the whole group, I think it's fabulous that they've thought enough about our community and the outside community to connect us and give us opportunities like that. So, thank you guys very much. Um, I know it was talked about, you know, people have had wonderful careers and experiences, but I think it also gets down to don't think that if you, if you haven't been president of a bank or, you know, had this extraordinary traveling, you know, life or something, you guys all have something wonderful to give. And again, it's about time. How many in here are parents? We're parents, right? I've got a kid that goes to school nine hours from here. If I had someone like you guys mentoring her or have, you know, knowing that they're checking in on her, that would mean the world to me as a parent. But you all know that you know, children are on their worst behavior with their parents. They're on their best behavior when they're with someone from the outside. And they also can, I think, connect and talk about things that they may not be able to talk to their parents about. Maybe they're going to school to be a doctor because their dad was a doctor, but really and truly, they don't want to be a doctor. They're not going to talk to their parents about that. They might d discuss it with you, and you can give them some guidance. So I think that don't think that you have to have had this extraordinary life. You, you know, we all have our talents and, and our love to give. And I think, you know, so don't limit that. But just being a parent alone, you're going to be able to relate to this kid, right? I mean, you've had kids going to school and you know the stresses. I think that's the interesting thing, too, is that when you guys were going to college or, or in school or were young, life was a little bit slower. It was a little bit different. The competition, I mean, it was all hard and we all worked hard, right? But today, the stresses on a student, there's a student, how stressed are you? Yeah. <laughs> it's so completely different, I think, that, you know, if they can understand that it's all going to be fine and that these expectations that are on them right now may be either self-inflicted or from society, that it's still going to be all right. Um, but I think just maintaining that type of relationship, it's not always all about career and success. Sometimes it's about emotional support. So that's just my input. Yeah. Anybody else? Questions? Uh, my grandchildren are all adults in their 20s. When I try to call them, they don't answer the phone, but they will text me back, and I don't do text. What should we expect from the students at Roanoke College? I think all students in that age frame of 13, 12, 13, up to college are texters. I mean, it's so easy. It's just easier. But if you set that precedent, like, I'm going to call you during these days, or I'm going to call you this time, and you make that prearrangement, or I'm going to send you snail mail, you can expect it once a month or twice a month. You know, just set that groundwork in advance what your expectations are. I would just add, I, I know our students are certainly capable of talking on the phone. I mean, I've spoken on the phone with students before, even if it isn't their preference. Um, I think, as Teresa said, if that precedent is set early, 
then phone is a fine mode of communication that our students can use. Yeah. A couple of years ago, during the uh, depths of the pandemic, when we were all isolated and we couldn't you know, have personal contact with, with one another, there was a professor of social work at JMU who wanted to introduce her advanced, I think undergraduate students, to old people. Because uh, as a social worker, they were gonna go out and work with a variety of people, including old people. And so a group of us uh, volunteered to interact with them over a Zoom conference about once a week. And as I recall, there were kind of four different groups of us who met with uh, two or three uh, in each group uh, of students. And the, the, the uh, students that I interacted with I, rec I recall in one of the first uh, interactions, they wanted to know what we wanted to get out of the session. <laughs> and my, my reaction was, I thought we were doing this because you wanted to get something out, out of this session. Um, so my question here is, what do, you, what do your students want to get out of this program? Uh, and in order for me to, to know what I'm supposed to do, I want to know what their goals are and what their purpose is in interacting with us. So yeah, I appreciate you sharing that experience. Um, at this point, uh, we are still in the, in the earlier conversation about what exactly this is going to look like. And that's part of the reason for this session, right, is to get that feedback, get that information from all of you so that this is really meaningful for everybody, right? Um, so we are in those early stages, but at the same time, um, we do intend to have you know, some early conversation, some structure with students and um, to get a better sense of what exactly they see. And perhaps, I don't know if we've actually fully discussed this yet, but some kind of a matching process where we get a better sense of what individual students are looking for and what y'all are looking for and use that and maybe not just the academic side, but use that as well as part of that like matching process um, so that it is clearer going in what everybody's looking for and uh, that would then provide a starting point for those conversations. And probably eventually it won't be that structured, but um, within a single mentorship. But early on, it helps to have that structure. Um, so we can certainly put that in. Uh, I don't know if, Shannon, you want to add anything? Or yeah. it, it, it sounds like that needs to be done before the interactions takes place. I'm just thinking that um, to match up people, sometimes maybe just a little questionnaire uh, for, on the, for the students to answer, and then we would as well. Uh, I myself am a perpetual student. I just love to learn things. So I'm back studying my um, high school Spanish, okay? using Duolingo on the computer. So I've got a streak going like 182 days in a row or something. But what I'm interested in, we have one resident here, Adria, who is from Cuba. So she's a native speaking Spaniard, Spanish speaker. I'm interested as an adult of senior status, um, is there anybody on campus at Roanoke College that would be interested in speaking with a a semi-dignified um, senior citizen who's <laughs> interested in some conversational Spanish. And I have pretty good English skills, so I like to edit. I like to pay attention to spelling. So those are the kinds of things I might offer to a student who's looking for somebody that just wants to chat, visit, go for coffee, go for lunch, come over, play chair, volleyball, I mean, some kind of crazy stuff that we got on going on over here, and just experience life 
on the plane that we are removed from. We have three kids and nine grands. I don't get to spend a whole lot of time with them because they're out and about. But I feel like having mentored a lot of kids in elementary school, especially little Latino children who were learning English, that's my love right now. That precipitated my desire to go back into learning Spanish again in depth. So I think that would be a starting point, maybe a little bit of questioning of your students. You know, what would you like to see in somebody that you meet from Brandon Oaks? Or, and then from our standpoint, what are we interested in? I want to see some young blood. I want to see what's going on in the world besides, you know, the senior issues that we pay attention to a lot, but we're not removed from the world yet. So <laughs> we may not understand what's going on in this young guy's life, but <laughs> we need to try to stay on track a little bit. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. My name is Jonathan Lee, and I work at the college, also an alumnus of the school. And I will tell you very quickly just a little bit about how we do this partnership between mentors and students with our slightly less experienced population base, those who are not retired yet, but who are actually working. Um, we have had a couple of hundred students work with mentors over the years. And the way that that actually operates, we do have a questionnaire in place. So the students will answer questions such as what they're majoring in, what they're interested in doing once they finish Roanoke College, where they're from, where they're perhaps interested in moving after they graduate. Maybe they're from Roanoke, but they really want to learn about DC or vice versa. There are several questions that we ask, and then we get the information from you, from friends of the college, from alums of the college who want to be mentors, and ask some of those same questions. What were your life experiences? Were you a Reno College alum or were you not? Um, where are you from originally? If you're from Boston, but you came to Roanoke and you've settled here, this is, you've made this your home, if we have students who are from Boston as well, that could be a great communication starter, conversation starter. So we do have some of these questionnaires in place not quite for the, this Brandon Oaks experience yet, because I think that'll need to be tweaked a little bit. But I think sort of the idea of getting the questions to all of you and then getting the questions to students so we can make that perfect match will be very appropriate. And I can just give you a couple of examples. We have worked with some mentors who are more life experienced, retired from the working field. Um, one of whom, I'll give two examples. One of whom, he was the head of surgery at the VA hospital. Roanoke College alum, um, daughter went to Roanoke College, son and, or grandson and granddaughter went to Roanoke College, but obviously he was no longer a practicing physician at the VA. But we had a student who was very interested in going to medical school with the specialty, specialty that he had. And the great thing about that experience was the student learned from someone who had been a surgeon had then supervised other doctors and surgeons who had worked with military veterans, run a huge healthcare facility right here in Salem, but also who could help make connections with individuals that he had mentored over the years. So there were doctors who were in their 40s and 50s that Dr. Wilson could then connect that student with. So it was a continuum. It wasn't just Dr. Wilson's experiences, which were fantastic, but it was also the people that Dr. Wilson could connect that student with. And the same along the lines of being a teacher. We have had a retired teacher who started as a teacher, became an assistant principal, retired as an assistant principal. Obviously, she's no longer working in the classroom now, but she's been able to tell her student about, here's what it was like whenever I started. Here's what it, how it evolved over the course of time. Here's why I made the decision to go from being in the classroom to becoming an administrator in the school system. And then let me also introduce you to some other people that I mentored along the way who are still in the classroom or still work in the Roanoke County, the Roanoke City school system now. And those students, they have really benefited from hearing about the stories and the experiences. They've benefited from sort of that networking. Not only did they end up, you know, Chaplain Bowen's point about getting one mentor, one connection, they ended up with two, three, or four, which was really fantastic. But they also 
and I think this is important. I think about my own life experience. My father was the youngest of nine. And my two oldest uncles fought in World War II. My father was a Vietnam veteran. He always made a very important point to me, and thankfully I had a great life experience with this, with family, seeing how all of you, seeing how somebody, maybe you meet someone who is 75 years old, you've had a great life story. You've had great experiences. That's something that I think that's really important for our students to understand. You were their age once, and one of these days, they're going to be your age. So sort of getting that whole continuum of life and learning about that, finding out about how you interact with your kids, your grandkids, whether it's by text, email, the professional piece is crucial and it's important. But I think just for them to understand life isn't all about being 18 to 22. And getting that perspective will be key for them. And at the same time, I think this is going to be a great program for all of you because you're going to think, all right, it's not all about being at Brandon Oaks either. There are students who are still in Salem and Roanoke College who want to go and do great things. I mean, it's not just all what you see on the news, but there are great students, great young people who have great ideas who want to make a big difference. Um, so I think the whole program I'm very excited about. We sort of have some examples and templates that we can use. We're going to tweak this tremendously for all of you, but there will definitely be a questionnaire in place so we can make some great connections for you and for them. So I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah, oh, yeah. Speaking of distinguished Roanoke College individuals. Hi, I'm Ben. And I taught chemistry at Roanoke College for 53 years. And over that period of time, I mentored lots of students. And in every single case, every single case, we were working on something together. It wasn't me teaching. Mentoring is not teaching. It was me working with a student on a research project. That's the first example that comes to mind. Or working with a student to get into medical school or graduate school. Or working with a student to develop a new idea. Every single case, it was the two of us working together. And I think if you're looking at this project, which I encourage you to continue with it, and you want it to be a kumbaya thing, it ain't going to work. I don't think either the students or those folks here that have been through much of their life need to sit around a campfire and sing campfire songs. That's another program. What you're going to need, if this is to be successful, in my opinion, is to use this questionnaire and find what kind of project can I do with a 19 to 24 year old that we can work together on, whatever it is. And it's gonna be different from a chemistry professor's point of view and from a sociology professor's point of view or from a chaplain's point of view. But if you can find that kind of thing that we can work together, I can work together with one of a student, then I think you got a chance. Anybody else? I'll just say a couple things. I think, I think it's really helpful to think about guiding the process. And, and as Kristen said earlier, that's exactly why we're here. And we will do the same thing at the college with students and ask them what they're looking for, what would be helpful for them. Um, I think we do know that structure helps. And so at the front end, we will need structure. What I hope is that then the relationships evolve so that some of the structure can back off a bit and you can enjoy the relationship. And that's when you really get to those connections that Chaplain Bowen has been talking about. Um, but you have to start. And so I love this idea of you all, you know, in this questionnaire, you all also telling us what would be fun. Um, so I'm sitting here next to Andy who could speak to you in Spanish and you could have a good time and talk about all kinds of interesting things. And so we can, we can do these pairings and we can think about purpose. Purpose is actually a word we use a lot at the college. And mentorships do have purpose. They're different than being a grandparent, right? But they can still be warm and meaningful. And so I'd love to see us develop a program that can be both over time. And I know that we can do it together. Uh, 
Uh, I'm Miss Sandra Stewart, a retired Roanoke County teacher, and I would like to commend the uh, uh, the education of your students who go into teaching. I mentored several Roanoke County um, Roanoke College uh, uh, to be teachers, and they were all will, really well prepared. Um, I'm listening to you have, who have spoken that you've worked on campus with them. It was easy for me to mentor those student teachers because they came to me and for day at a time after school. I think that the problem with this is going to be the time frame. And I, <laughs> you may have to teach Bob Miller how to text because, <laughs> because in my situation with three grandchildren, they don't want to spend a lot of time on the phone with grandmother. Hi, grandmother. How are you? Well, I'm glad, to, I'm glad you called me. Bye. <laughs> you know, they, they're too busy. And so... Um, I would suggest that you use texting to your student a lot and sending cards uh, rather than, and even maybe a Zoom meeting because um, they just don't, even my older, I have three teenage grandsons and um, two in Roanoke County Schools and one in Louisa, Virginia. And they, they're really nice on the phone, but they just don't want to talk long. And they'll say, well, bye, grandmother, I love you, and that's it. And these children that we're going to work with, they're busy, and it's hard, even with me, it's hard for me to think about how can I give up some of my time when I'm involved in things here to match a time that that student doesn't feel stressed that we're coming to them. So whatever you can work out on the time frame and how to set up times when we're coming and going, which also takes time. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah, sociology. Yeah, and if we look across time too, I mean, we see that. Uh, we were just talking about this last week, but uh, yeah, we or earlier this week, uh, we see um, increasingly this kind of segregation, just spatially, um, socially, uh, in terms of modes of communication. Even like we're talking about now, this kind of disconnect across generations, um, which I think you know provides further justification for being really intentional about having these kinds of programs in place, um, because if we just kind of leave our social spaces as they are, we, you know, we don't have that opportunity. We really need to intentionally foster those connections. And so that's, that's really one of the main purposes of this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I'm a little curious in knowing um, what started this interest, and what is the students at Warner College, what are they saying about having this kind of opportunity or getting it started? What are they looking for? So this idea kind of started back when um, Dr. Frank Shushak came on campus, and he was talking about what his hopes were for Roanoke College in the upcoming years that his presidency and his involvement. And he talked about how, you know, students come on campus and Roanoke College does all these things to prepare the students. And they teach them all the education they need and then they send them out into the world and ideally they pair them up with alumni. And so then they get additional work experience. Well, what happens when your alumni retire? Where do they go? They come here. So there's still so much that our alumni and other, not even just Roanoke College, but other colleges, all these skills that you guys as residents have, you can turn that back over and give it back to the community. So that's what kind of started that. And then I was paired with Dr. Anderson and we've kind of talked about things and explained what my hopes and dreams are with all this. And there's just a lot of potential there. You know, talking with each of you individually, hearing your stories, life experiences, all the things that you are doing. You guys are so amazing and have so much to offer. And so that, share those experiences with these students and don't let your stories just stop here. Take it out into the world. So that's kind of where this is going. Um, Nancy?
<laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a really important question, and I will say we are not forcing students to do this, right? This is going to be purely voluntary for them, um, so we're not going to, you know, force students to participate. Um, so th that interest does need to be there to begin with for them to participate in the program. Now, I, I guess the concern is, you know, if we build it, will they come? And based on early conversations, not with the in, uh, formal, we haven't had a formal meeting quite like this with the, you know, the entire you know, department, student body, whatever. But um, based on early conversations with uh, smaller you know, classrooms of students, there is interest. There is certainly interest to participate. And that doesn't mean that all of those students are going to participate, but um, it's gonna be voluntary. And, and just based on my experiences with the students, I do think that there is going to be interest in this. And I know that my thought is not necessarily a guarantee from the student body that they will be interested. Um, but I'm, I'm confident that we're going to have, a beginning with a small handful of students, right? We're not going to immediately have this as a, a large scale uh, enterprise. But on a small scale, I, I know we will have at least, you know, the number of students, what, 10 or so students who are interested. Well, I mean, we communicate with students in a lot of ways. Um, God, uh, just personally interacting, you know, in the classroom, gauging interest in the classroom setting. Um, we have events on campus, and perhaps we can initially have an event on campus that is specifically about this opportunity. I think that would be a really important starting point for us in having that conversation with students. Um, and then moving from there uh, through advising. I mean, I have. We all have advisees, <laughs> many of them, um, who we interact with on a regular basis. And um, sometimes in having those conversations, um, we see a need. We see a need, whether that be um, a need to interact with somebody else on campus or off campus. Um, so I think there are a number of avenues. There's not one formal process uh, to start that we're going to use other than right, having that bigger conversation, a more formal event. And then those more informal pipelines, I think, are gonna be really important. I, I would say just to, to piggyback a little bit, just like we're doing here, we wanna open up the conversation to students and get a sense of what they're looking for. Um, the word mentorship gets dropped everywhere right now. It's kind of a hot word. And so we do wanna make sure that there's enough structure for what we're doing to be meaningful and worth everybody's time and effort, right? You all are still busy and have things going on that you wanna do, so we're, we are not looking to just take up your time unnecessarily. We think this is really important and meaningful, or of course we wouldn't be here with you this afternoon. And we see the need in our offices. So Kristen mentioned advising. Our students come by much more than they actually have to. They are seeking relationships. There's no question, and so the questions we do want to ask is what kinds of relationships? What do they want to talk about? Do they want to talk to somebody about shared interests? Or do they want to talk to somebody about what it means to be a teacher? Right? We have to work on all these pieces. But this is so, so helpful today, all of your comments and questions. So please know that we are hearing all of this in the most productive and constructive of ways. Will it be easy for you to distribute the questionnaire? I think up front, the questionnaire should go out to, to, to uh, what they're doing teaching. Pre-excite them. They don't know what you, explain what it's all about, then add the questionnaire, and that that come back to you to, to, so you can formulate your program with us. So I think um, 
uh, I think the questionnaire is very important up front. So, so the great news is that we're going to be working with Teresa on all kinds of things because the first conversation that Kristen and I had with her showed us all these different ways we can be connected. So it, there's not a hurry. We don't have to run at this and not do it well. We want to do it thoughtfully, so we will. We'll, we'll talk to students, we'll get the ball rolling, and we will work with folks here and make sure we're doing it in a way that makes sense. I will say it's important to know that sometimes mentorship pairs don't work. And that's okay if a couple of them don't work, because most of them will. But it's not, nothing's perfect, right? So I don't want you to feel like if somebody gets paired and it's not perfect that the whole program is a failure. That's, that's certainly not the case. To both the last two questions, we can drill down on any particular student and communicate with them, because not only do they go to class, they live on campus. <laughs> so we can communicate to them in the classroom, we can communicate with them digitally, and we can communicate with them right where they live, right? We can use our residence life staff to knock on doors. I mean, if there are particular partnerships we think would be meaningful, we will, we will make sure that the students who are open and interested have every bit of access to hearing about, learning about, filling out the survey, and getting um, that going. That's, that's a pretty, <laughs> Pretty easy when they're literally, it's like being aboard ship, really. I mean, not to steal a naval term, but I was in Virginia Beach for a decade um, before I came up here. So um, yeah, they're, they're on board, we're deployed, um, we're underway. Um, so they're captive for the most part. We, we can get at them pretty easily, so don't worry about that. Like we, like us. You, you can. So, so I think you all are bringing very valid concerns to the table today. And as Shannon has mentioned, this is an excellent opportunity to throw things out that we may not have even considered. And what I'm hearing you saying is you're concerned about time. I hear there's different, it sounds like some people want to be paired with profession, like the profession that they're used to. Some just want to have conversational Spanish. And all those questions and all those things are gonna be reflected on the survey that will come out. So as you continue to think of things, please bring them to my attention. Um, you know, or hey, I, I'm not interested in mentoring, but here's some things that I know from past experiences that you wanna ask or inquire about. So I think this is all great. Um, it, it, there, there are going to be growing pains. We're gonna try and match people. It's not gonna work. You know, we forgot to ask whatever question it was, you know, and it's just gonna have to, develop over time and we'll fine tune it. But we do need people who are willing to try. And that's, that's what I'm hoping for, is that you guys will at least give this a try. Having been a teacher of various sorts, um, I picked up a little phrase, maybe you've heard it, I can't remember who said it, but I aspire to inspire before I expire. <laughs> so to aspire means to, to reach for greater heights or to, you know what that word means, and to inspire means to take in something of a new idea, a new thought that can cause growth before we expire, but we also want to share those inspirations. So. I think anything we do is always risky when we haven't done it before. It's risky to be a new parent. What do I do now? The baby's crying. You know, I can't get the baby to stop. The baby's spitting up all over the place. I mean, there are things that are risky, you know. So I guess we just reach out and take a risk. Yeah, 
as I as I sit and listen to this, it, it sounds like the dating game, um, <laughs> and I've I've never I've never participated in these online dating matchups, but <clears throat> the, as, as I understand them, you know somebody who's interested in it fills out a questionnaire of what what their background is, what their interest is, and, and then somebody, the computer or somebody, some. Somebody, <laughs> we, we, we've got a group of people here who are trying to, to make matchups. And, and, and I, guess, I guess, you know, the best, the best two matchups over here, they have to get together and they have to interview each other and spend some time with each other. And, and it, it might be love at first sight and it might be hate at first sight or hate after three or four interactions but if you don't try you're never going to you're never going to know so just a little bit to take it a little further i i popped into teresa's office and they were in the office and there was so much excitement going on i just kind of got like <laughs> captivated by it and, and pulled into the bubble. And so what came out of that quick conversation was when I said I'm director of development and I raise money, they went, oh, well, we might be able to help you do that. So one of the things we want to do, we, and I think you're a student, public health care, is that? Yeah. So public health, um, you can get a degree in public health, obviously, and we want people to get degrees in public health and come work and, and grow organizations and campuses like this. Um, but one of the things, as you know, that you have to do in nonprofit is raise money. So I'm so thrilled that Renault College is investing because people just throw you out into the world and say, oh, you can be a director here. Oh, and by the way, when you get hired, you're going to have to raise all the money to make it work. Well, people aren't really teaching those skills so much. Now now they are, but years ago they were not. So I commend Roanoke College for teaching the public health class that you have to write grants and you have to pair with community uh, partners and things like that. So that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna go talk about Brandon Oaks and, and give them a little bit of guidance, but they're gonna decide what to write a grant about and write an actual grant and do a presentation to us. So cross your fingers that that grant will get some money uh, in here, but mainly what it's gonna do is give them some real life experience in the challenges of writing grants and but the necessity. And so I just wanna let you know, um, starting uh, at the end of this month, we will start that mentorship. Um, so we're doing it not just on a resident level, but on a faculty level as well. So thank you. Yes, our students in their senior year work in small groups, partner with community organizations. We were so excited. I didn't know Brandon Oaks was a nonprofit. And when y'all started talking about all the things that you do, Kristen and I got really excited really fast because we're always looking for great partners in the community. And so it's exciting that you're gonna, you're gonna come visit the class and the students will get to come out and look at, the, at, at your lovely home. And so it's a wonderful, wonderful partnership. Yeah. And, and this, I'm teaching this course, and we, we had our first day of class yesterday, um, and I am so excited. Um, and they're excited, and it, it's just, um, we did this, um, uh, we've done this a few times as this course, um, but with COVID, everything got kind of interrupted. So last year was really the first year that we had this, like, coming together of all these different organizations and this great conversation uh, at the end of the semester as the students presented their work. So I'm really looking forward to that, and I'm excited that, that, that you, Julie, and Brandon Oaks is going to be a part of that. Well, thank you all very much for your time. Um, I think there was a lot of ground made today and uh, look forward just to kind of moving forward now and just getting the ball rolling and seeing kind of where this year, uh, year takes us. So um, I would like to invite you to stick around for about another hour if you would like and just mingle in the back. We've got some scones and fruit and drink. Um, so if there's any additional questions that you would like to reach out to anyone that is here today from Roanoke College, um, please do so. But thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Chaplain Bowen. Thank you, Kristen, Shannon, Lee. Thank you guys so much for being here and just giving us your time. <laughs>